Chapter Twenty Two of Flash Evans, Camera Newshawk, by Frank Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Chapter Twenty Two: The Major's Disappearance. Captain Johns pressed his finger steadily on the elevator signal bell. When the cage did not immediately ascend, he started up the stairway. Flash followed him. It was the hotel clerk who telephoned me he explained major hartgrove can't be located his room is empty and there is evidence of a brutal attack rascomb flash began only to be cut short how could rascomb have had anything to do with it captain johns demanded with a snort of impatience we were with him for the past twenty minutes young man you should devote your talents to picture taking i'm right about rascomb flash maintained stubbornly but if you want to drop the matter that's your concern i intend to swear out a warrant for his arrest on a charge of assault you couldn't do a more foolish thing the captain snapped no don't go i want to have a talk with you but first i must learn what has happened upstairs flash followed his companion down the corridor to room two sixty seven the door stood half open and several hotel officials an excited bellboy and a chambermaid already were gathered there what has happened demanded captain johns gruffly we don't know answered the hotel manager nervously i followed your instructions sir the clerk explained in exactly twenty minutes after you left the lobby i telephoned this room failing to arouse major hartgrove i sent a boy up here this is the way the room was found nothing has been touched flash gazed curiously about one of the beds had been used the other remained neatly made up. A chair was overturned. Suitcases lay open, their contents spread about the floor. The room has been ransacked, the captain muttered, and I know what they were after. Can you tell if anything is missing? asked the manager. Major Hartgrove carried important documents upon his person. Captain Johns made a silent appraisal of the bedroom. He examined the contents of the suitcases the windows opening upon the fire escape and then questioned the bellboy and the chambermaid in turn neither had seen strangers on the floor during the past two hours nor had they observed major hartgrove since early in the evening as the inquiry continued flash became aware of how fast time was slipping away he was annoyed at captain john's slow but thorough way of conducting the investigation and he was disgusted because the army man refused to believe that rascomb was an impostor rascomb had a finger in the major's disappearance he thought grimly but no one ever will believe it i may as well save my breath knowing that doyle would be expecting him he decided to await the captain's pleasure no longer without bothering to explain that he was leaving he went to join the news view technician where have you been flash doyle greeted him impatiently i've kept the car waiting fifteen minutes i was having a talk with rascomb i saw him myself in the lobby flash you're dead wrong about let's not say anything more about rascomb tonight or later flash broke in wearily i'm willing to forget him then let's move said doyle picking up his suitcase this is a swell hotel not even a boy to carry your luggage everyone is in major hartgrove's room what's going on there oh nothing of consequence flash remarked enjoying the effect of his news major hartgrove has been kidnapped that's all doyle stopped short kidnapped it looks that way he disappeared from his room and the place has been ransacked this isn't another of your yarns call it that flash shrugged i'm tired of trying to convince anyone of anything don't get sore doyle said placatingly tell me what happened relenting flash related all which had transpired at the interview with gordon and rascomb and likewise told of the summons to major hartgrove's room you'll scoff he ended but i think rascomb called johns and me into conference so he would have an alibi when it was discovered hartgrove was missing doyle did not laugh you cling like a leech to your theory that povey and rascomb are the same person i do 
if captain johns would have rascomb arrested i could prove in two minutes that my story is straight rascomb can't get rid of his scar it was a transparent trick covering it up with bandages well i don't know doyle replied doubtfully you're honest in your opinion but i still think you jump to conclusions if i were you i'd forget about rascomb i intend to do exactly that flash agreed but just wait when it is too late captain johns will discover that rascomb has disappeared no chance of getting pictures tonight i suppose doyle commented thoughtfully but maybe the story will have developed by the time we come back here tomorrow what documents was the major carrying i don't know captain johns hasn't told me very much i would guess they might be specifications or official reports pertaining to bailey brooks new invention and who would be interested in anything of that sort kidnapping is a more dangerous sport than it once was another government could use that parachute especially in wartime povey was dickering with brooks for its purchase and not getting very far yes i remember he was interested in the parachute test doyle admitted slowly povey followed hartgrove on the train after the wreck someone and i'm satisfied it was povey attacked the major and tried to rob him you didn't tell me that no and you figure povey was the man i do without question it was povey to avoid arrest he made it appear he had been killed but see here flash brooks parachute barely had been successfully tested at the time of the wreck your reasoning is as full of holes as a sieve i'm not saying what povey was after that's my guess well it may have been povey who attacked the major the first time doyle conceded but to connect him with rascomb i've seen both men they don't look alike they don't act alike okay flash cut in let's skip it now where is the car in front of the hotel they passed through the revolving doors and moved to the curb doyle looked up and down the street finally signaling a driver in a new black touring car we're riding to clinton and style he grinned so i see a chauffeur i pick this man up cheap with a driver we'll both be able to sleep i can use some said flash the car drew up at the curb doyle introduced the chauffeur as clarence purcell he was a sharp-faced individual of forty with dark eyes and an unpleasant habit of sniffing his nose at frequent intervals how long will it take to reach clinton flash asked him hard to tell the man answered there's a bridge out east of here we'll have to take a detour which will slow us down we'll arrive there by seven o'clock oh sure easy you fellows roll up on the back seat and leave the driving to me i'll get you there the car rode smoothly and clarence purcell was a skilful driver as soon as they were well out of the city doyle rearranged the cameras to make more footroom he stretched out comfortably pillowing his head on his overcoat i'm catching forty winks he said better do the same we'll have a tough day tomorrow flash was weary to the point of exhaustion but for some reason he could not sleep his head ached disconnected thoughts kept racing through his mind maybe i shouldn't have left excelsior city without at least trying to have rascomb arrested he reflected oh well it's too late now rolling up on the opposite side of the seat he closed his eyes sleep refused to come arousing a few minutes later he surprised clarence purcell in the act of peering over his shoulder into the back of the car observing that flash was awake he quickly turned his head again the night was dark not a star illuminated the sky glancing out the window flash could not see beyond the hedges which lined the road nor was he certain of his directions where are we anyway he asked the driver fifty-eight miles out of excelsior city it must be turned around it seems to me we're traveling the wrong direction the road twists flash settled down again and at length dropped off to sleep he awakened to find the car no longer moving straightening up he looked about him the automobile was parked beside the highway not far from an all-night restaurant and filling station 
the driver had disappeared flash rolled down the window gazing toward the lighted cafe the main grill room was deserted save for the proprietress and a man who appeared to be using a telephone flash nudged doyle to awaken him what's the matter now the technician mumbled drowsily why have we stopped that's what i would like to know replied flash our driver is inside the cafe telephoning he's acting peculiar before doyle could offer an opinion the chauffeur came hurriedly toward the car why have we stopped flash asked him sharply oh you're awake the man exclaimed i had to stop to find out about the roads we took a wrong turn how much time have we wasted doyle demanded not any if we keep going i found out about another road we can take it's rough for a few miles but connects with our highway okay let's be traveling doyle said curling up in the seat again why were you telephoning flash questioned the driver i called back to the nearest town for road instructions no one in the cafe could give me accurate information i notice you didn't inquire at the filling station the attendant was busy i knew you were in a hurry so i telephoned never mind growled doyle irritably let's get started the car moved on down the road turning at the first corner for the next ten minutes they followed a narrow twisting dirt highway which led deep into a pine woods flash had lost all desire to sleep the chauffeur's explanation did not satisfy him as the car bumped on mile after mile over the deserted road doyle too began to show signs of nervousness how much farther he asked the driver we'll soon be where we're going the words had a ring which flash did not like turning to doyle he asked him in an undertone where he had obtained the driver the technician remained silent for a moment then he gave his answer reluctantly you're not going to like this flash but i may as well tell you rascomb recommended him rascomb yes i met him in the hotel lobby and doyle did not finish for the chauffeur had applied brakes before either he or flash could act the man whirled around covering them with a revolver reach he ordered harshly this is the end of the line end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of flash evans cameron newshawk by frank bell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter twenty three captives say what is this doyle demanded in an angry voice put up your hands the chauffeur ordered again don't try any clever business or i'll let you have it now get out of the car silently flash and doyle obeyed walk straight ahead down the road their captor commanded is this a stick-up doyle asked standing his ground the revolver prodded his back no it isn't a stick-up brother move along before i get impatient where are you taking us you'll find out soon enough keep looking straight ahead doyle glanced sideways at flash as they marched down the road hands held high don't think i had any part in this he muttered i was double-crossed by that swine rascomb you delivered us both into his hands flash agreed bitterly maybe now you're willing to believe what i told you about him i've been a dumb ox all right if you had only listened hey no talk ordered the man behind them keep quiet a few yards farther up the road he commanded the pair to turn into a path on their right it led through dense woods to a small log cabin blinds covered all the windows but a crack of light shining from beneath one of them gave evidence of occupancy keeping his revolver trained upon flash and doyle the chauffeur rapped twice on the door almost at once it was opened by a burly man whose fleshy face looked hard and cruel in the dim light you took long enough getting here he said roughly made it as quick as i could the chauffeur answered 
you can go now i'll take over he held a whispered conference with the burly man who then walked swiftly away through the forest flash and doyle were forced to enter the cabin the room in which they found themselves was dirty and provided with the plainest of furniture opening from it was a second room get in there the chauffeur ordered say listen doyle protested angrily tell us what this is all about why are we being held because you've learned too much buddy you and your pal how long are you keeping us here all depends if you take it easy and don't make no trouble we may let you out tomorrow after herbert rascomb has skipped the country drawled flash the chauffeur pushed them roughly into the dark room slamming the door he turned a key in the lock flash and doyle stood motionless listening they both could hear the wheezing breath of someone who slept we have company flash muttered tracing the sound he crossed the room to a cot which had been set up against a wall he could not see the man who lay there reaching out he touched his hand the sleeper instantly awoke with a startled rasp in his throat he swung his feet to the floor and sat up who is it he demanded hoarsely flash thought he recognized the voice major hartgrove and who are you the army man countered flash and doyle gave their names and sat down on the edge of the cot in whispers they told how they had been tricked by rascomb's chauffeur so rascomb is behind this the major commented i should have known how did they get you here major questioned flash earlier this evening i was attacked by a man who entered my hotel room by using the fire escape the man who was guarding the cabin yes he took me by surprise overpowered me and at the point of a pistol made me go down the fire escape to a waiting car i was brought here and were you robbed the major did not reply immediately he thought a moment and then said i may as well tell you now i doubt if i'll ever get out of this alive anyway yes i was robbed not money doyle prompted no i had possession of important government papers correspondence which never should fall into the hands of an enemy i had plans and specifications for a new tank the army is considering nothing pertaining to bailey brooks parachute flash asked quickly those plans were among my papers admitted the major captain johns and i have been working on them intensively the past few days the truth is brooks parachute hasn't quite come up to our strict requirements our experts have suggested several changes which are being tried out then the government has decided to purchase the parachute it depends upon a final test which is to be held tomorrow and if it should fail the test will be successful declared the major confidently bailey brooks himself is making the jump but it is a grave matter for the plans to fall into the hands of the enemy flash fell silent as he thought over what he had learned he knew that rascomb had been intensely interested in the bailey brooks invention unquestionably he had engineered the theft but it was difficult to understand why the man delayed his getaway now that the plans were in his possession arising abruptly flash began to explore the prison room any chance of getting out of here none whatsoever the major responded there is no window if we try to break down the door we'll only stop a bullet they'll probably let us out tomorrow doyle said after rascomb has safely fled the country and then it will be too late flash exclaimed if only we could get out of here tonight rascomb might still be captured the three prisoners were startled to hear a sharp rap on the door quiet in there for a long while flash and his two companions conversed in whispers after they had discussed every angle of the situation and were agreed that it was hopeless they lapsed into a moody silence presently flash aroused himself i have an idea he told the others it probably won't work but i'll try it in whispers he revealed what he intended to do then walking over to the door he pounded to attract the guard's attention lay off of that 
the man ordered listen we're suffocating in here flash protested now ain't that too bad the chauffeur asked sarcastically and us with the air conditioner busted down <laughs> open the door i ain't that big a fool at least give us some water to drink so you want water <laughs> flash was prepared to have the request turned down to his surprise the guard made no answer but a minute later he unlocked the door a beam of light shot across the floor stand back all of you he ordered covering the three keeping his back to the door the chauffeur deposited a bottle of water on the table help yourselves he said flash moved to the table with pretended eagerness he reached for the bottle his hand brushed carelessly against it over it went rolling across the table he made an elaborate effort to save the contents for a fleeting instant the guard's attention focused suspiciously upon flash and his gaze was diverted from doyle and major hartgrove that instant was sufficient acting together they leapt upon him knocking the revolver from his hand End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Flash Evans Camera News Hawk by Frank Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter twenty four A Desperate Chance. The fight was brief but intense. Caught completely off guard, the chauffeur proved no match for three desperate opponents. A hard blow on the jaw sent him reeling backwards. He fell and was pinned to the floor flash groped about in the dark until he found the revolver he jammed its muzzle into the chauffeur's ribs let me have that ordered major hartgrove taking the weapon from him see if you can find some rope flash ran into the adjoining room and after a brief search located a coil which evidently had been brought to the cabin by rascomb's men doyle and the major dragged the chauffeur into the lighted room skillfully they trussed him up and set him in a chair now you'll talk said major hartgrove if you refuse i know how to change your mind you're working for rascomb never heard of him <laughs> albert povey then supplied flash i don't know either of them guys the chauffeur insisted who hired you to waylay flash and me if it wasn't rascomb demanded doyle he recommended you as a driver the chauffeur glared at his three questioners refusing to speak you know what a charge of kidnapping means in this state reminded the major a life sentence an expression of fear came over the chauffeur's face he began to tremble now if you come clean tell us everything you know you may get off with a lighter sentence the major went on but if rascomb makes good his escape you'll be the one to take the rap this is the first job i've ever done for him the chauffeur whined my orders were to let you all escape in the morning what became of the papers stolen from me major hartgrove asked rascomb has them and where is he now i don't know you're lying accused the major has he gone to melbridge field not rascomb he's flying to mexico tonight. flying exclaimed flash in his own plane yeah at the hotel i heard him telephone a man by the name of floor he told him to be at the airport by five o'clock rascomb must have meant his own private field flash said looking at his watch it's fifteen after three now but we still have a chance to stop him how far are we from excelsior city asked the major forty-seven miles the chauffeur informed let's get started flash urged tersely we haven't a minute to lose major hartgrove untied the chauffeur's feet and they forced the man to walk back to the road where the car had been left flash slid behind the wheel as they rode through the night at a furious pace doyle and major hartgrove continued to question their prisoner they soon satisfied themselves that he knew almost nothing about rascomb's past i only met the guy yesterday he insisted rascomb offered me a chance to pick up some easy money he let on he wanted to play a joke on some friends of his 
I was to drive the car. Until tonight, I didn't have no idea I was getting mixed up in a kidnapping, and maybe worse. What do you mean, worse? The major inquired. Well, I don't want to have any hand in letting an innocent man be killed. That's why I'm spilling everything I know. Raskin planted one of his men at Melbridge Field. He hasn't fixed so some poor guy will get killed tomorrow when they test out a parachute. Bailey Brooks. Yeah, he's the one. I heard Raskin talking about it. I see, said the major explosively. Raskin figured that if Brooks were killed in the test, the parachute would be discredited and the army would lose all interest. Then, with the plans in his possession, he would quietly transfer them to his own government. But we'll stop that test. Flash pressed his foot harder on the accelerator. He was afraid to look at his watch again. The speedometer warned him that they were not making good time. Soon they came to a small town which Flash recognized. A narrow country road bisected the one they were following. He eased on the brake. Major, this would be a shortcut to Clear Lake. How about taking it? Major Hartgrove glanced at his prisoner. Flash read the thought. This town must have a constable in a jail, he said. We could drop him here and go on. Yes, that will be wiser than trying to take the longer route, agreed Major Hartgrove. They aroused a sleepy official from his bed and turned the chauffeur over to him. Explanations were necessary. The constable was slow to understand. We are losing entirely too much time, the major fumed. You stay here and enter a charge against this man, Flash proposed. Doyle and I will go on to Clear Lake. Unless we move fast, Rascom is certain to get away. The major considered briefly and consented. I'll telephone to Excelsior City for a police squad, he promised. By the time you reach Clear Lake, help should be there. I'll follow as quickly as I can. Armed with the Major's revolver, Flash and Doyle raced on toward Clear Lake. The road they had chosen was bedded with loose gravel. Small stones were thrown against the windshield and fenders as the car skidded around corners. Doyle snapped on a light and looked at his watch. Twenty after four he announced we'll never make it we will unless rascomb takes off ahead of time flash answered grimly dawn was beginning to color the eastern sky trees and houses along the road gradually assumed definite shape the air was heavy with smoke from the forest fire which still raged miles away flash and doyle drove through clear lake at ten minutes of five houses were dark the streets deserted there was no police delegation to meet them. Doyle nervously fingered the loaded revolver. It looks as if we're on our own, he said, unless that chauffeur gave us a bum steer. They were drawn near the private airfield. Flash snapped off the headlight beams. As the car swung around a bend of the road, they saw the cleared field ahead of them, shrouded in the morning mist. Flash leaned forward. A plane stood near the hangar propeller turning blue flames licking from its exhaust it's rascomb he shouted we're too late doyle groaned no chance to stop him now a gate which gave entrance to the private field had been left open flash whirled the wheel and they went through bumping over the uneven ground rascomb sat at the controls of the monoplane with fleur in the cockpit behind him they both saw the approaching car derisively Raskin waved his hand. Speeding up the engine, he taxied to the end of the cleared space, then nosed the plane into the wind. We've lost him, Doyle exclaimed. He's taking off. Flash had noted the direction of the wind and the path which the plane must travel. There's only one way to stop him, he cried. As the plane roared down the field, he deliberately headed the car straight toward it. Jump, he shouted to Doyle. Save yourself. We're going to crash head on. End of chapter 24
jump flash shouted again as his companion did not obey doyle braced himself against the floorboards i'm sticking he said stop him if you can flash the monoplane roared down the field straight toward the car rapidly gathering speed for the takeoff in another instant its wheels would leave the ground flash pressed the accelerator pedal to the floor the car fairly leapt ahead too late rascomb saw what the cameraman meant to do he shouted and swerved the plane but he could not act quickly enough to avert a crash the car smashed into the plane's left wing with terrific impact flash was thrown violently against the windshield for several minutes he lay in a semi daze then his mind cleared and he shook himself free from the mass of twisted steel doyle was lying limp on the seat his chin slumped on his chest as flash touched him his eyes opened stop him he mumbled stop him if you can relieved that doyle seemed only stunned flash seized the revolver which had fallen to the car seat forcing open the battered door he climbed from the wreckage one glance disclosed floor lying face downward on the ground but where was rascomb in bewilderment flash gazed across the field he saw a dark figure running toward the woods which bordered the road rascomb had escaped injury and was trying to escape halt flash shouted halt or i'll fire the man did not pause he darted into the shelter of the woods and was lost to view flash started to follow but his legs wobbled beneath him the crash had shaken him more than he had realized he never would be able to overtake rascomb as he considered whether or not to remain and guard floor who might recover consciousness he heard the roar of a speeding automobile he turned to gaze toward the road and his heart leapt a car loaded with armed men had turned into the field help had arrived major hartgrove was the first to jump from the car get rascomb flash gasped he escaped into the woods leaving one man behind to guard floor major hartgrove and his recruits took up the chase as flash assisted doyle from the battered car he could see their flashlights moving in and out among the tall pines did you capture rascomb doyle muttered holding his head in his hands not yet but we will he hasn't a chance against six men where's floor over by the hangar he's out cold how are you feeling now shaken up doyle answered but i'll be all right as soon as i collect my wits too bad we didn't get a picture of that crash it was a beauty the technician's words reminded flash of his automatic newsreel camera which had been carried in the rear of the automobile he groaned at the thought what's the matter flash doyle asked in surprise my camera it's probably ground to powder maybe not i packed it carefully in the case darting back to the car flash began to burrow in the wreckage he pulled out the cases of equipment and eagerly examined them so far as he could tell the camera was not damaged but only thrown out of adjustment i may as well waste some film just for the fun of it he said to doyle with a grin from somewhere deep in the woods two shots rang out in rapid succession the cameraman listened tensely there were no other shots but in a few minutes major hartgrove and his posse came into the clearing with rascomb manacled to one of the men they got him doyle exclaimed jubilantly flash trained his camera on the group and despite his excitement managed to hold it steady as the film ran through rascomb was grim but smiling as he was led to the waiting automobile his gaze fastened upon flash you win he said grudgingly i didn't figure you would have the courage to crash my plane but then you live a charmed life major hartgrove turned to flash and grasped his hand he saw the crash as we came down the road he explained it was a foolhardy thing to do but magnificent if you hadn't stopped povey he would have escaped to mexico i threw you off the track for a time major the prisoner said pleasantly it was this fresh kid who tossed a monkey wrench into plans i've been building up for years you made your final mistake when you had doyle and me waylaid tonight said flash i was tired of trying to convince anyone you were povey 
if you had allowed us to go on to clinton i probably never would have bothered you again that was one of my mistakes the man agreed another was inviting me to my lodge why did you do that i knew you were wondering if i might not be povey i intended to convince you otherwise you might have succeeded save for one thing yes my scar betrayed me my makeup was not as clever as i thought even so i should have escaped had you not lived such a charmed life and you are very handy at opening locked doors there's one thing i would like to know said flash how did you manage to give out the impression that albert povey had been killed in the train wreck i don't mind telling you not in the least it was very simple while on the train i fell into conversation with a man who chanced to mention that he had entered this country recently and had no relatives or friends living here the man was killed in the wreck prompted major hartgrove he was i merely transferred my own identification papers to his pockets then later i claimed the body and had it buried in the clear lake cemetery you thought that with albert povey dead the government would drop its case against him commented the major then as herbert rascomb you would be free to continue your espionage work oh no major the prisoner corrected this was to have been my last deal i am not as young as i once was and excitement palls upon one i had planned to retire to mexico and live a quiet respectable existence you'll find prison a quiet place major hartgrove said dryly undoubtedly i trust you'll visit me some time so that we may chat about old times you really proved yourself very stupid major kindly hand over the plans to bailey brooks invention major hartgrove ordered testily it will save a disagreeable search anything to oblige rascomb drew a fat packet of papers from his pocket and dropped it into the major's hand one request he said my man Clore, knew nothing of my real past attorney gordon also is blameless i trust you will not try to involve them now gentlemen is there anything else you wish to know you had nothing to do with the train wreck flash inquired after a moment no i merely profited by it for years i have been building up the respectable character of rascomb i knew that i was being closely watched by the department of justice so when the chance came for povey's fade out i took it both rascomb and Fleur were loaded into the car and driven back to excelsior city where the latter was taken to the prison hospital for emergency treatment flash was greatly relieved to learn that the caretaker had not been seriously injured in the crash and would recover now to round up the remaining members of rascomb's ring major hartgrove said briskly it may take us weeks but eventually we'll get every man who ever worked with him what about bailey brooks flash questioned anxiously the parachute test has been ordered stopped yes i telephoned melbridge field over an hour ago and talked with brooks himself the test will be postponed his mind relieved flash went with george doyle to dispatch a telegram to mr clews of the newsview company afterwards since it was too late to cover the strike at clinton they engaged a hotel room and went to bed it was late afternoon when flash awoke to hear someone pounding on the door the visitor proved to be captain johns i didn't mean to wake you up he apologized that's all right returned flash we've slept the clock around anyway captain johns had come to report that another member of rascomb's ring had been taken into custody major hartgrove has identified the man as the one who entered his hotel room and robbed him the captain revealed he was caught when he applied at the airport for a ticket to new york then your case is closed doyle inquired very nearly so captain johns chatted for several minutes revealing interesting details about rascomb's past life taking a snapshot from his pocket he gave it to flash it was the missing picture of rascomb which had been obtained at the indianapolis races so it was you who took it from my room exclaimed flash and i blame doyle i am the guilty party 
admitted captain johns for weeks i had been investigating rascomb's record however i did not agree with you that he was albert povey you proved me wrong and i am glad you did it gives me pleasure to congratulate you after the captain had gone flash was not slack in apologizing to doyle for having misjudged him it was a natural mistake to make the technician replied forget it later in the afternoon a telegram arrived from mr clews praising the two cameramen for their recent pictures the message ended take a week's rest you have both earned it we have news view by the tail now doyle grinned and boy can we use that week off working on the brandale ledger again will seem like a picnic after this added flash the smile faded from doyle's face you're not thinking of going back he asked why you've made a name for yourself with news view they'll give you anything you want on a silver platter i'm only filling in for joe flash reminded him sure i know but there are other jobs with news view maybe we could keep on working together flash remained thoughtfully silent you don't like me doyle said after a long moment i can't blame you because i deliberately make it hard the truth is i thought you were nothing but a fresh kid i wanted the job for a friend of mine i know smiled flash i've changed my mind about you but naturally you wouldn't feel the same way i do interrupted flash extending his hand shake pal then you're willing to forget doyle demanded eagerly and keep on with news view well for a few weeks but i've promised to return to the ledger you'll have a job waiting with news view whenever you want it doyle predicted and you'll come back once a newsreel cameraman always one the excitement seeps into your blood yes doyle you're right flash said heartily taking ordinary pictures will seem pretty tame after this one of these days i'll probably be coming back the end end of chapter twenty five end of flash evans camera news hawk by frank bell